Um, and okay, <laughs> I am uh, currently in uh, in Berlin, um, and I am uh, part of the uh, Fermat uh, Consortium, um, as well as the Noband uh, uh, Laboratory. So, Noband um, Laboratory um, headed by uh, Matthias Scheffler, who you just heard, and Fermat. Um, headed by uh, Claudia Draxel at the Humboldt University in, uh, in Berlin. Uh, yeah, unfortunately I couldn't be there in, uh, in Kigali. Uh, I checked today and apparently uh, didn't miss too much, at least today the temperature and, and, and climate is not that different from Berlin. <laughs> at least I can convince myself that I didn't lose anything. Um, <laughs> Uh, so what I want to talk today uh, about is the uh, artificial intelligence uh, toolkit. And uh, so you heard a little bit already the uh, introduction about uh, uh, kind of discussion about fair data uh, from uh, uh, Gianmarco. And uh, so the uh, artificial intelligence toolkit is a part of um, uh, the Nomad Laboratory Infrastructure. And um, so the Nomad Laboratory Infrastructure um, uh, is, uh, um, let's say, a kind of uh, diverse infrastructure in which we have um, mainly um, an, an archive of uh, uh, material science data so far, mostly or overwhelmingly uh, uh, mostly the uh, uh, these are computational um, the material science data, but uh, slowly we are introducing uh, experimental data. And uh, uh, the archive is fueled by the uh, what we call the repository. So the idea is that people upload the uh, raw input and output from atomistic simulation codes. And when you go to experiment, it will be somewhat raw information from uh, the experiments. Um, using the electronic lab uh, uh, notebooks, but uh, I don't go into these details today. Uh, and then we have uh, uh, parsers that transform the uh, input and output information that is uh, uh, written differently in every different code into an internal representation uh, that is uh, somewhat code independent. I will uh, talk a little bit about this internal representation um, in a few minutes. And once we have the data in the, in the archive, they can be accessed in different ways. Um, and one of the way they can be accessed is the artificial intelligence toolkit that I will be talking about today. We have also an encyclopedia and a, a, a browser-based graphical user interface to really browse the data. Um, if you're interested, I can direct you to, um, yeah, tutorials that have been held uh, here at Fermat. So we have the video and you can essentially go through the, the tutorials again uh, without losing information. And uh, certainly you're familiar with the, uh, the meaning of FAIR as a findable, accessible, interoperable and reusable uh, data. Um, but uh, recently in a... Uh, um, Nature Perspective Communication uh, by Matthias Schaeffer and many other authors that are part of the Fermat Consortium. It was to pro propose that FAIR could also mean F for findable again, but AIR becomes uh, uh, artificial intelligence ready data. Hinting at the fact that uh, uh, data that are stored in a FAIR uh, according to FAIR rules are uh, really unleash uh, all, all their power uh, if they are uh, used in conjunction with artificial intelligence. And I will be uh, telling a little bit about this is, why, why this is uh, so. Um, now, at some point soon, I will be, go live on the, on the website. This is still a snapshot. Um, the artificial intelligence toolkit uh, uh, presents itself uh, as a yeah, um, colorful uh, entry page uh, with a few uh, key uh, entry points. And uh, I will go through the, the different uh, entry points uh, that can be reached by, by these four buttons. Um, uh, 
uh, the, the, the first one that is really related to how the, the uh, nomad archive can be queried in order to do uh, um, on the fly uh, kind of uh, analysis uh, will be uh, either at the end of uh, today lecture or at the beginning of uh, this afternoon lecture will be taken care of by a, a video that I will be show uh, will be showing uh, that is uh, that has been recorded by Luigi Svilo. Actually, Luigi will be also with us uh, this afternoon for the hands-on session, um, and he is the main uh, developer uh, currently of the artificial intelligence toolkit. And this part that uh, puts you really into the uh, core matter of the of the toolkit in terms of uh, accessing the data and analyzing them. Uh, will be described by him in the video, and then he will be also available for uh, questions to, together with me. Um, now, um, the next, uh, so what I, I want to uh, kind of uh, summarize now is uh, that the, the artificial intelligence toolkit serves uh, uh, different purposes, uh, and uh, these purposes can be uh, yeah, uh, summarizing this kind of uh, uh, flowchart. So we have a, a unique entry point for the artificial intelligence toolkit. And one uh, of the purpose is to access uh, uh, the, uh, the Nomad archive and doing artificial intelligence analysis. Uh, meta info is what uh, is the name we give to our uh, metadata schema um, uh, that we have implemented in, in, in the Nomad uh, archive in order to uh, um, kind of categorize and, and verify the data, so make them fair. Um, and I will say something about this meta info in, in a few slides towards the end of this lecture. Um, so what the toolkit is, is um, uh, present itself as a um, yeah, browser-based uh, interface, and uh, behind, uh, so what uh, people can access uh, by it is, is a collection of Python notebooks. There is no registration necessary to run the Python notebooks that we already offer, and to operate with them in some sense. And if you know, if you're familiar with Python notebooks, you know what I mean. Otherwise, I would uh, show a little bit in this lecture and. Uh, more uh, in that uh, this afternoon. But if you do a registration, uh, you uh, have access to some uh, personal storage space, uh, namely 10 gigabytes, and you can share uh, the product of your work, essentially. While if you don't register, what you do ends with the session. Uh, so when you finish the session, I mean, you can still download uh, the data on your local computer, but online they will be lost. Um, the with more uh, detail about the technology, well, slight more detail about technology, we uh, have behind uh, uh, yeah powerful um, infrastructure technologies in order to make the uh, notebooks uh, running in, uh, in 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 your browser. Most notably, they run in a Docker container, and this allows us. Uh, to uh, create uh, a, also a Docker container that can be run locally on your machine. So uh, essentially everything that uh, we'll be showing today uh, will be um, uh, online and you can do it online uh, if bandwidth allows. Um, but um, I, I will show this afternoon a short video again by Luigi uh, Spilo. Uh, uh, explaining how to uh, download uh, a, a Docker image of the whole uh, notebook. So we call this the local app uh, with not too much uh, fantasy uh, of the Nomad uh, Artificial Intelligence Toolkit uh, that can run on your laptop. Uh, as long as you have 10, 15 gigabytes to spare on your laptop, you can, and, and you have Docker installed on your laptop or local machine, whatever, you can run everything that is online uh, locally. And yeah, it, if online the content changes, uh, the, the, you can also uh, um, 
upgrade uh, um, uh, your uh, the content on your on your laptop. Um, so yeah, okay. We have several machine learning packages that are supported in the, in the, in the artificial intelligence toolkit. Uh, for example, famous Cited Learner or, or TensorFlow, uh, and they are already uh, mounted in the in the Docker image, so you don't have to do essentially anything to uh, use them. Uh, you just import them in your uh, workspace. Um, and uh, yeah, uh, if you work online, uh, the, the servers are currently hosted at the Max Planck Computer and Data Facility Center in um, uh, in Garten. Uh, yeah. Uh, Okay. Um, the other interesting uh, aspect of uh, uh, the artificial intelligence toolkit uh, being a collection of, uh, of uh, notebooks, notebooks are uh, 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 an incredibly useful tool for doing tutorials, uh, hands-on uh, hands tutorials, as you can see today. Um, and uh, so uh, tutorials to learn uh, artificial intelligence tools, uh, as, essentially from scratch. So we have a few tutorials in which uh, we start from uh, very basic uh, information uh, and pre-knowledge on, on statistics and we build and, and, and uh, uh, have uh, some uh, artificial intelligence tools that are explained to the, to the user. And we present both uh, known text, uh, textbook artificial intelligence tools and, and uh, recent tools like uh, CISO or subject discovery that uh, uh, Matthias Schaffler has just presented to you. And, and last but not least, or if possible, because the original motivation uh, to build the artificial intelligence toolkit is to uh, essentially bring the uh, reproducibility part of uh, the FAIR uh, data paradigm. So the, the R is, reusability, reproposability, as according to, to, to some. But in general, the underlying idea is, is the uh, reproducibility of uh, scientific uh, uh, workflows. Meaning, if you have a publication, you have followed the workflows that typically starts from some data acquisition and you have to perform some analysis. Nowadays, it is becoming more and more custom that this analysis is artificial intelligence kind of analysis. And um, it, it is really, uh, um, yeah, it would be really great if every time one publishes a paper with such kind of uh, uh, more or less complex workflow, one can document uh, to the tiny details the workflow so that one, uh, um, any user could go and reproduce everything, starting from the raw data to the final result, meaning some plots that you have uh, on the on the paper. And this is exactly what we also support in this, uh, in this artificial intelligence toolkit. We have a collection of notebooks where we present publications that we show in a, in a short while, um, including something that Matthias talked about, for example, the perovskite classification tool. Um, we have the notebook there so that people can re-obtain the descriptor uh, and, and can uh, manipulate, change uh, some input information in order to possibly obtain something different and also can reproduce uh, results that are published in the, in the paper. Um, okay. Uh, before I jump to the uh, live uh, view of, uh, of the toolkit, I want to do a little bit of my personal specification of artificial intelligence tool. And this is a purpose uh, in general uh, uh, on how the, uh, the toolkit itself is organized, but also uh, as a kind of uh, super short uh, course in artificial intelligence. Being the artificial intelligence toolkit about artificial intelligence, I'd like to see uh, my uh, idea about uh, very shortly. So, uh, and what I show is a little bit uh, of a classification of artificial intelligence tools um, that is um, somewhat it's partially standard and partially uh, not so standard. So what we have uh, as a big container is what uh, uh, the community calls artificial intelligence uh, that is often taken as a synonym of a machine learning, but actually, uh, strictly speaking, this is not the case. Artificial intelligence is much broader than uh, machine learning. And uh, uh, in, in artificial intelligence, we have uh, uh, all the algorithms that uh, mimic or try to mimic human intelligence uh, in some sense. 
So there is not necessarily any learning in this kind of algorithm. And I will specify more clearly what I, the community means by learning. Uh, but uh, suffice to say is that um, uh, in artificial intelligence, we have uh, also uh, the old style if then rules. So if a programmer sit down and makes all the possible uh, uh, if then clauses uh, to uh, describe a certain uh, process or phenomenon, uh, this is also called artificial intelligence. So the program runs through and, 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 and uh, checks all the if then clauses and uh, uh, reacts consequently. This is also called artificial intelligence. At least in, that was the initial formulation of artificial intelligence, but even today, this is artificial intelligence. And then we have other things uh, uh, like compressed sensing that is typically considered outside machine learning. Uh, Matthias mentioned it a bit what is compressed sensing in his uh, talk. Uh, and, and then we have also machine learning inside uh, as a subset of artificial intelligence tools. Uh, now, I, I want to present you with uh, my friend uh, Platypus, uh, just to say that now I'm going to do actually a couple of different classifications inside artificial intelligence. And the Platypus is here to uh, remind you that uh, every time we try to do classification taxonomy, to use the more uh, uh, scientific term, um, in, a, in a set of heterogeneous uh, individuals, we may encounter a little bit of a hybrid uh, uh, yeah, species. So the, 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 the platypus is a mammal, but has a beak like a duck and lays eggs. So it's a very special kind of mammal, but yeah. Uh, so if you are strict with the uh, taxonomy in zoology, uh, platypus is a little bit of a strange uh, guy. Um, so one kind of uh, classification that we can do in artificial intelligence that is uh, uh, rarely pointed out is uh, between the so-called exploratory analysis and confirmatory analysis. I would claim that most of uh, the um, uh, artificial intelligence that is done and aimed for is confirmatory analysis. So there's some kind of fitting. Uh, so regression, meaning that one tries to fit some continuous value or classification, one tries to predict uh, belonging to some class, predefined class uh, of, uh, of individuals. Um, a, a little bit less visited area of artificial intelligence is exploratory analysis. Uh, actually, to you, this shouldn't be at all new because uh, I couldn't participate yesterday, but I've seen uh, that uh, both uh, Alessandro and um, uh, Lion and Michele Ceriotti uh, talked about uh, unsuper unsupervised learning. Uh, unsupervised learning is not exactly the same exploratory analysis, but the tool that you can use in exploratory analysis. Analysis. You would, you can have also supervised learning in in, in exploratory analysis. Uh, and one example is subgroup discovery. Now I'm already making a little bit too complicated, but just if you have heard these terms before, uh, I wanted to kind of uh, tease you a little bit. Um, so exploratory analysis is really, uh, yeah, as the name suggests, an analysis in, in which uh, uh, the purpose is to explore the data, so to find the structure. In the, in the data, uh, uh, rather than try to predict a specific quantity out of the data. Uh, as part of exploratory analysis, we have clustering uh, and dimension reduction. So uh, I, I suppose uh, yesterday, uh, Alessandro went uh, deeply into these uh, methodologies and Matthias has presented subgroup discovery as an example of exploratory analysis. Another kind of classification, as you see, I went back to the overall container and now I jump into machine learning. Uh, is um, uh, machine learning. Uh, so uh, the mach machine learning is statistical learning of, uh, uh, so it's algorithm that performs statistical learning that still doesn't say anything. Uh, uh, the key point is learning. So an algorithm is learning when uh, it improves. Uh, so when it delivers a model that improves strictly monotonically uh, with the uh, with data, uh, and um, and um, so um, this is a, a very strict requirement. So the more data that you provide to the to to, to the algorithm uh, for the learning uh, process, uh, the more the model has to be uh, uh, predictive. 
if this doesn't happen, uh, it, it, there is a problem. <laughs> it's not a learning algorithm. Uh, and the mathematical tool um, uh, uh, for which this uh, really happens is uh, uh, regularized regression. But he has mentioned in uh, when explaining CISO that there is a regularization. This uh, uh, could be L0 or L1. Um, and you have other type of regularization like L2. So I'm not going to make a, a, a full course in machine learning here. Uh, but this is the key uh, thing in, uh, in machine learning. In, in, uh, yeah, in the learning part of uh, machine learning. There must be a regularization. Now, a very interesting subset of machine learning is what uh, people uh, more recently call representation learning. So this is something that was not realized probably in the early time of machine learning, but there, are, uh, there is a subclass of uh, uh, learning algorithm that not only learn a predictive model, but also learn a, a, a internal or not so internal representation. So that means that one always starts from some description of the data, um, some initial uh, features that, that describe your data. You have to represent your data numerically in some way or another in order to present them to your learning algorithm. There are uh, uh, machine learning algorithms that essentially take the uh, input description as is and use it wholly, completely uh, to uh, perform the prediction. So they cannot really leave out any piece of the internal, uh, of the initial uh, input representation um, description to just change the, the, the wording. Uh, and there are methods uh, and famously deep learning uh, that uh, build an internal representation. If you look in a, in a neural network uh, and you uh, somewhat look at any internal layer, typically people look at the, the last layer, uh, you have essentially a, a different representation uh, with respect to what you have input in. And this uh, representation is, uh, has been learned together with the model uh, in order to effectively represent the data such that the last layer performs a simple operation and uh, relatively simple operation, but it's uh, much simpler than the overall uh, network uh, and, and predicts the results. There is another uh, strategy that is symbolic inference and CISO as presented by Matthias is part of this symbolic inference. Also sample discovery is part of this symbolic inference. So the model, the algorithm learns a representation, what, uh, uh, we call the Matthias has uh, called in, in his talk, uh, the descriptor. So we give a lot of uh, input, uh, including some possibly redundant uh, and, and completely useless input. And, and the model uh, selects uh, the useful representation. And actually different from deep learning and symbolic inference, uh, part of the result is giving you the equation <laughs> that uh, that uh, uh, describes this internal representation. Okay, uh, and a subset of uh, representation is of course deep learning, just to put everything uh, uh, on the on the plate. Um, okay, so the white screen uh, reminds me that now I go to the live uh, demo, uh, semi live because I pre-run everything in the background. But at least now I am on a on a on a web browser. I went to the so you see it's in a web browser, nomadlab.eu. I prefer the full screen thing. Um, and, the, and from this uh, Nomad Lab um, main page, you access the toolkit by clicking this button. And as I was showing before, you are presented with this uh, entry page. So uh, before I go into uh, say these two parts that uh, uh, are related to what I was showing in this uh, uh, diagram, uh, um, hands-on tutorial or uh, yeah, uh, shallow learning curve tutorial for artificial intelligence tool and uh, reprodu reproduction and let's say interactive uh, 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 understanding of uh, uh, published results. Um, I go uh, and show quickly what this get to work is. So this is for, uh, let's say, users that have already uh, looked into the, the existing material and are already developing their own thing. Uh, I go to um, a different window because 
uh, this is incognito because then I'm not logged in in this uh, uh, window because what I want to show is that if you go to go to work, hopefully it works, yes. So you are presented with a, a login window. And uh, if you have uh, an account, uh, you just enter here. If you don't have an account, you go to register and uh, you can create it uh, very quickly. Um, I invite you to do this before this afternoon, because again, there is no need to, to, to register, but you will have some benefits by, by, by registering and then running uh, as a registered user. So again, you go from get to work and then you will be uh, presented with this uh, input thing. Um, so back to uh, to this, and then you refresh the window and you will be logged in uh, also in this page here. Um, okay, so we have, uh, so if you click uh, view tutorials, what you are presented with is a list, oh, actually, no, I forgot. Uh, if you scroll a little bit down here, you have a little bit of description, some introductory video, uh, very uh, so some short uh, uh, cartoonish uh, introduction to why the toolkit is interesting, a uh, longer introduction by, uh, again, Luigi, uh, that covers some of the materials that we'll be showing now. And a somewhat new thing that we have here is this, um, uh, uh, lecture series. Uh, so if you are new uh, to artificial intelligence at all, you could go here, click this, uh, this button here, and what you're presented is a kind of uh, reasoned uh, uh, selected list of uh, tutorials uh, that introduce to uh, machine learning tools. Um, this uh, so if you open here, you have a, a, a lecture. Um, the, the introduction one is only lecture, but then from the second one on, you always have some uh, longish lecture and, uh, and then a notebook that uh, allows you to uh, uh, go through the material that's presented in the lecture itself. So this uh, series of lectures is actually part of uh, a course that has been given um, yeah, end of 2020, beginning of 2021 uh, by the Nomad Laboratory. It is a little bit more lecture than uh, what we have uh, selected uh, in this uh, uh, for the toolkit, um, because we selected those that have a specific notebook uh, uh, accompanying the lecture itself. So the video is, a, uh, the two videos together are a fully fledged uh, uh, university lecture on the topic and then the notebook contains uh, the same topic in a, in a tutorial, hands-on fashion. Uh, so in this way, if you go through all, all the steps, uh, you by the end, you have quite some uh, insight in, uh, in, in machine learning, artificial intelligence in general, sorry, uh, and uh, including some uh, modern stuff, not just the, the, the basic textbook uh, things, all applied to material science relevant uh, examples. So uh, back to the uh, initial page. And now, if you click on view tutorials, you would have uh, 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 this uh, menu in which you have uh, access to um, the uh, tools. So the layout is similar to the lecture, but now these are have no specific order, except they are separated in classes. You have a beginner level here, and in the intermediate and then the uh, level. So the advanced level is the next uh, menu. Um, and so, but here you can choose whatever you want. Uh, there is no uh, sequence in these uh, in these uh, notebooks. Uh, we have a search tool. Uh, if you have in mind a specific author of the uh, notebook, you can uh, uh, browse it here. If you have in mind a specific method, you uh, can find it here. Uh, and so if you if you just say it's a little bit of a flat list, so you have a classification that is a macro category as well as specific uh, uh, clustering uh, uh, algorithm like DBSCAN or some machine learning tool like Decision Tree or Deep Neural Network. And if you click one, you get, okay, you have a tutorial on uh, Deep Neural Network on the one and you could uh, select it. Uh, or, uh, or if you have in mind some specific application, you have here a list of uh, uh, data sets, essentially. 
Um, yeah, so each of these uh, entries in the menu have uh, 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 the direct access to the tutorial. Some of them uh, have a, a short video introducing the tutorial itself. Uh, uh, and then, uh, yeah, each method has its own sources, so all the metadata here is. Uh, is here. Um, okay, uh, what I wanted to say here. Uh, no, not, not much more. Uh, so, before I go to some examples, actually will be the examples that I'm showing are all in the category of uh, reproduce published results. So if you click reproduce results here, you will find this menu that is a very uh, a similar layout to the, the one about the, the uh, yeah, uh, simple intermediate level tutorials on methods. But this, here the focus is really the specific paper. So Matthias at some point mentioned the Kaggle competition. Here you have a tutorial that uh, shows, uh, so guides you uh, to reproduce some of the result in this uh, Kaggle competition um, and many other uh, recent publications uh, that uh, uh, you can find here. Uh, but of course, I mean, many is probably not the, the right word. Um, several, that is the right word. Uh, the idea here is that the community at some point uh, uh, collaborates with us. This is uh, intended to be a community driven tool. Um, uh, and uh, uh, hopefully following the, the example that we show here, even you uh, among the audience at the moment you have a, a publication, uh, it doesn't necessarily have to be with artificial intelligence, but at the end of the day, any kind of analysis that you do this day, on the data is artificial intelligence one way or another. Uh, so the important thing is that you go from uh, the raw data to uh, some kind of analysis and this can be captured in a, in a workflow that can be shown in a Python notebook. And if you want to have your uh, workflow and therefore a notebook uh, published on the toolkit, just contact us and, uh, and uh, we will find a way to, 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 to have it published. Um, okay, so I think at this point I'm going to, yes, uh, one example. So the example I've chosen is uh, discovery of the topological insulator in alloy tetrodamide. Uh, so if you click this one, you go to tutorial, you would find this tutorial. So this is a Jupyter notebook. Uh, if you're familiar with the Jupyter notebooks, so they normally have a slightly different, more uh, uh, simple layout. Uh, we have, so we essentially has worked to give a, a kind of more vibrant layout, I would say, uh, but this is by all means a Jupyter notebook. So everything you know about Jupyter notebook can be found here. Um, and this uh, notebook is related to a paper that uh, uh, yeah, so was published uh, yeah, a couple of years ago on uh, uh, yeah, uh, CISO uh, driven uh, identification of uh, a descriptor for classifying a certain class of material called tetrodermites. They have this nice structure and they appear in layers. Um, and, and they can be depending on composition, they can be uh, uh, topological insulator or um, trivial insulator. And uh, actually they can also be uh, metals, uh, but uh, okay. This, this um, classification covers the topological versus trivial insulator uh, classification. Um, so back to the notebook. So, I want to zoom out just to show the impression of the notebook. So it's, uh, uh, there is uh, some, some, some text, some initial introduction of the problem. Uh, and then uh, this particular notebook has a nice uh, graphical interface for uh, uh, controlling the input and then some result. Uh, let me go back to the um, readable view. So let's keep the introduction. I focus on the 
uh, input mask. So uh, the ID, this is a CISO. Uh, what is running behind is CISO++ code. Uh, and, uh, and here you can select uh, uh, which uh, features you want to have. This is a possible set of features. You are free to add more uh, if you toggle on uh, the notebooks, everybody of you that knows what a Python notebook is, will find their uh, Python cells um, in order to do some extra uh, kind of uh, operations. Uh, but otherwise, uh, especially at the beginning, uh, I'm trying to find again <laughs> where is the input mask, uh, you, uh, can work with this input mask and, and select uh, input features, possible operators by just clicking and unclicking, and some hyperparameters of, uh, of CISO. Then you run. I'm not running now, it's pre run because it takes four or five minutes to run. Um, and uh, CISO finds uh, uh, a descriptor. Uh, in this case, uh, uh, we present the one dimensional and the two dimensional model. And I focus on the two-dimensional model because the two-dimensional model is the one that gives us a materials map. So material, materials has been talking about uh, uh, one possible goal of artificial intelligence in the material science is to find a materials map where each point on this plot that is, as you see, interactive is a composition. You know the composition, uh, the descriptor tells you the coordinates on this map and, and, and you will know whether the material is a topological insulator or a trivial insulator. Uh, and then you have some extra stuff like uh, the, the, the code um, um, draws the convex envelope of the data points of the training data points so that you know that if you land inside this convex hull, you have a good chance that you are doing a good prediction. Uh, if you land outside these this convex hulls, uh, you should be careful because probably, uh, but probably it's possible that you would need uh, a retraining to that the model. Uh, because everything, the model itself was selected on the basis of the data that are containing these convex hulls. So the separation is valid strictly as long as you stay in the convex hull or at least you have high confidence that it is valid right? as long as you stay in the convex cell. And uh, what happens uh, down here, if you click uh, data points, you uh, have a, a kind of J mole, actually JS mole representation of the structure that you can uh, yeah, investigate what, uh, what are distances, what are these purpose or angles that uh, the moment you can pull out, yes. So here is the angles. Uh, and um, yeah. and um, so the important thing is that this information is not just living inside this notebook. Uh, it's pulled from the Nomad archive. So this data that you see have been calculated with the DFT code that I believe is VASP. And the raw data are in the Nomad archive. At the beginning of this uh, notebook, somewhere there is a query on the archive. That's here. Uh, I don't go into detail now because the whole video uh, from Luigi that was probably will show this afternoon, I would say, um, uh, will explain how you uh, query the, the archive. So. Here we have an API um, that uh, uh, allows you to access the archive that is uh, imported uh, with these commands at the beginning of the uh, Python cell. And then there is some kind of uh, 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 search. Actually, in this case, we pull a specific data set that was pre-identified because it was the data set that was used for this publication. So this thing, that, as this identifier as a DOI, we pull a data set that has a specific DOI uh, in the Nomad archive. And then we perform the analysis. Uh, I'm being uh, uh, kind of uh, I'm going to details here because it's important to, to understand that 
the data that you see here, actually the metadata, uh, are uh, so including this plot uh, are pulled directly from the archive. Uh, yeah, and then you can um, play around and say I want to see another structure, and then yeah, if you click the other one, uh, you uh, open the other plot so that you can do comparison because you want to compare how these two structures are with respect to the other. And the other thing is that uh, this plot here has a lot of controls. Um, so if you uh, want to directly uh, somewhat publish uh, or get a slide, uh, uh, make a slide out of this plot, you can do directly here. You, know, you, you can increase the size uh, and arrange the, uh, the layout such that you get a, a nice plot at some point if you click somewhere, print, and you would get uh, uh, some uh, JPEG or, or PNG uh, format that you can use that in a publication or at least in a, in a slide for a talk. Uh, and I, what I wanted to show is that, uh, let's say that this plot that you get from this uh, notebook is exactly the same, if not um, a <laughs> nicer looking than the one that we have in the publication, right? So this was the published one, and here we have uh, the notebook version. So the, the, the user can see that you make, so here we have pre-selected exactly the same input as in the paper, and you would obtain exactly the same output. And then you could change here and obtain a different uh, descriptor. Okay. Um, I'm not checking if there are questions. So, Nice the moderator to interrupt me if uh, there are urgent questions. But what I want to do now is to show another uh, uh, of these notebooks. Uh, that would be, let me go back to the list. Uh, here, finding a tolerance factor to predict perovskite stability with CISO. Again, it's a CISO thing. Sorry for the uh, kind of. Uh, in-house <laughs> selection, but uh, uh, these notebooks have been uh, uh, yeah, done uh, in depth and, uh, and, uh, and yeah, tested several times. So uh, they are I'm fully confident they, 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 they work nicely. And I wanted to say a thing that I forgot to say, yes. So this uh, tool here for visualization is actually a package that can be used in, in, in all notebooks. So we have this modular uh, uh, kind of uh, uh, choice for the for the uh, artificial intelligence toolkit. So if you are in another notebook, you just import this uh, this package. Uh, we call it the visualizer. Okay, not too much fantasy, uh, and and you can essentially have same kind of layout in uh, in any other notebook. So. Um, in, the, in this uh, notebook here, uh, we um, reproduce the results of this uh, uh, nice paper on, uh, on finding the uh, um, tolerance factor, improving on the Goldschmidt uh, tolerance factor. So Matthias has talked about this uh, publication. Um, and uh, yeah, so this is currently uh, the most uh, cited uh, application paper on uh, that is done by, by CISO. And one of the possible reasons is that, uh, okay, there is the artificial intelligence machinery, but at the end of the day, what we produce as a result is this nice looking uh, tolerance factor that is um, very simple, simple to use. So people, even without bothering how this, uh, uh, equation was obtained and uh, they can uh, uh, provide it that they have this so-called Shannon ready eye at hand for all materials, uh, all uh, elements, uh, they can calculate this tolerance factor and evaluate whether you have or not uh, in, in perovskite. And hopefully, oops, uh, the notebook itself is uh, helping even more people doing this because uh, the notebook is structured in such way that you uh, can uh, obtain uh, different uh, descriptors. So you can obtain the same descriptor uh, from 
the basic input features, you can obtain another one uh, by manipulating the, the input features. Sorry, I'm scrolling a little bit because I want to go to the results. There are several diagrams that are also in the in the in the paper. So this is also very nice uh, that people can. Uh, uh, again, reproduce exactly what has been obtained in the paper. And, uh, and, and uh, yeah, okay, so this was the final point that I want to reach. Um, the, um, one of the things that you will notice the moment you start uh, reading literature on, uh, on artificial intelligence and you want to reproduce things is that people, if they are kind, or if the editor is becoming a bit more fair oriented, uh, so people will make the, the data set available. In essentially all the cases, people do not tell you exactly what was the uh, training versus validation split of the data. Uh, and this is sometimes a problem, uh, or often a problem, because you cannot do exactly the same thing that was done in the paper. So you don't know exactly uh, uh, if maybe you are not retaining the same result because you did a mistake or what. Uh, so it's not the only, only way. I mean, one can even just flag in the data set what was the training, what was the, the, the validation set, simply. Uh, but this kind of notebooks uh, allow you to, uh, allow the user to kind of uh, uh, do the same thing with exactly the same data, use exactly in the same way over and over. And then you can change the moment you're confident that you think comparable result, you can change and, and do whatever you want. So the final thing that I want to show here is that uh, we have the, um, so the moment the, the, the descriptor has been calculated in this particular case, uh, I have rerun the notebook such that we obtain exactly the same descriptor as in the, in the paper. And then you uh, write down your uh, uh, preferred material. Um, so barium, titanium oxide or, or zirconium oxide. And uh, not only you get the prediction here on whether this is or not perovskite, the moment I run the thing underneath, magic, uh, the barium zirconium oxide that I just typed in, it is classified. So with plots similar to what we published in the paper, uh, you see that uh, uh, this material is definitely inside the uh, perovskite uh, area. Let me see if I remember correctly and I put here titanium. It should be non perovskite precisely. I have to run this cell. And the material is now not in, the, in this. So what you have, this is again a material map. You have to consider only the top part because it's symmetric. Uh, and what you have is, as an input is the radius of the B material and the A material. If you want to change, uh, you, you can change the representation. So the A uh, with the uh, X material. So you would see if you change the material, uh, uh, what happens. Change the material so means to change the composition. As Matthias was, said, was saying, uh, numerically, I can change at will this radii radius of uh, the cation, radius of the anion. Uh, but of course, uh, it's not given, and you have a very, very nice smooth plot. But of course, it's not given that for each value of the radius here, you have a, a, a chemical composition. That, uh, a, a chemical element that has these Shannon values. But there is another possibility that you have a mixture of elements, and you can assume that actually the overall property is, is given by the linear combination of the uh, in the mixture. So let's say that instead of having only one atom A in your, uh, uh, let me show in this case here. So instead, or we say B, <laughs> instead of having only one atom B in your composition, you have two, um, and you take the linear combination, or in this case, just the, uh, the, the, the average between the two. Uh, uh, and you, uh, and then you, you essentially open up to have a, a, a continuous uh, material space. This is not always possible, of course. Not all materials are a function of the linear combination of the composition, as you well know. But if this is uh, possible, uh, then of course you could find the material that has the desired radius, essentially. 
Uh, okay, so this is just to say that at some point you can start fantasizing on, on the results and, and, and think how to, to, uh, to find new pair of skites, for example. Uh, okay, I think I have exhausted what it, oops, where is the, yes, the presentation. Uh, what happens now? Ah, okay, I had this slide, but I didn't use them. So, I want to go to the end of the talk. Why this doesn't work? No. Sorry. No. Okay. I want to go here. Okay, so what I wanted to show is that uh, the normal artificial intelligence toolkit has uh, uh, three important purposes. It allows for artificial intelligence analysis of the normal archive data. I hinted at that, and this afternoon you will see how exactly to do that in the hands-on session. Uh, it introduces a shallow learning curve hands-on tutorial for state-of-the-art artificial intelligence method that people can just go without much pre-knowledge. Uh, even about Jupyter notebooks, you will see that these are use, useful, easy to uh, run, especially if they are already mounted on your uh, browser without too much to do. And then we uh, try to uh, boost reproducibility uh, in, that is in, in the FAIR paradigm uh, by having uh, the, the whole uh, data analysis workflow uh, of published papers. And uh, of course, everything you've seen is uh, coming from the work of many people uh, during uh, actually many years. And here I put today the main developers, of course, the original concept of uh, uh, well, not of course, starting from the original concept that is uh, from Matthias Schaeffer, uh, Luigi Bailo and Adam Fekete are uh, the uh, main developer of the current version that have been previous uh, developers and, and support for the infrastructure. And then here is the kind of hall of fame for people that have contributed with notebooks. So hopefully I will see some of the names of the uh, audience today soon in my next uh, talk. Well, you will see also your name. Here. And uh, the overall uh, Nomad Lab and Fermat uh, uh, support is coming again from the chef and Claudia Jackson. Thank you for your attention. I'm open for questions, even though I almost exhausted the time. <laughs> Thank you. I stopped sharing, but I can go back in case. Thank you very much, um, Luca. Yeah. Does anybody have questions for Luke? Yes, Christian has a question. Yeah, yeah, it comes with the mic, you say. Yep. Thanks for the nice talk, Luca. Thank you. Please, I want to know what is the convex hole and uh -huh. how it's related to the parameter like a mean mean uh, absolute error uh, to, 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 see, to test the accuracy of a uh, petition. Okay, thanks. Uh, I was a little bit uh, fast there um, and relied too much on, on, on Matthias presentation before. Um, so let me try to, uh, uh, let me go back to that slide. It's too much. Oh, no, actually this would be on the online thing. Okay, uh, one second, share screen. Okay, you see the plot with the convex hull? Probably you can now, yes. Okay, so this um, uh, model is a classification model. So the uh, CISO here is trying to predict, uh, given in this case, the composition of the material. Uh, whether the material is a topological insulator or uh, a, a trivial insulator. Um, so in a classification, uh, you, you also have errors, yes, that uh, are not shown uh, easily now in this, in this, uh, uh, in this uh, notebook, uh, but you have the so-called classification error. So you want to know uh, how often your prediction is correct and not correct, or more specifically, you want to know if you predict that you are 
the topological insulator um, uh, and the material was actually a trivial insulator. If you predict that you are a trivial material was a topological insulator, um, and then you have uh, the, 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 the correct predictions. Uh, these things are arranged in what is called a confusion matrix. So you predict that something is class A when it was class A, class B when it was class B, and then you have the errors. It was class A when it was class B, class B when it was class A. Uh, so this is your metric for classification. So um, it is not shown here. Uh, and and uh, if I try now to pull it out uh, uh, on the fly, I will fail miserably. <laughs> but we can try probably this afternoon. Um, so the convex hull has nothing to do with the classification error. So it just tells you that uh, in this particular representation, all the uh, data points that were used for training entered this, uh, uh, this uh, um, convex set. Uh, I stress convex because CISO, when it does a classification, is explicitly looking for uh, a representation. Uh, in this case, two-dimensional, in which the two classes can be separated into convex sets, right? So it is really embedded into the algorithm that you have to have two convex sets that are as disjoint as possible, right? So in this particular case, there is no overlap between this, the two convex sets. So we have a perfect, so-called perfect classification. Uh, you could have a situation in which you have a partial overlap because essentially you would not find any representation such that you have a perfect uh, uh, split. Uh, so that's the meaning of convex hull. It tells you uh, uh, um, where the data are supposed to appear and uh, and uh, and how good uh, uh, so and and check if the classification is is uh, well separated or not. But to, to, to assess the accuracy of the classification, you need to go to this uh, confusion matrix that I hinted at that is not shown here at the moment. Uh, you may be familiar with the wording of false positive, false negative, especially in COVID time, everybody knows what false positive and false negative is. Uh, and this is exactly coming from a so-called confusion matrix. I hope I answered the question. Thank you. If you go to an example where we have a regression, then the prediction error become important. So as Matthias showed, uh, these this, uh, violin plots or however you want to, to represent your uh, prediction errors. Um, uh, now, out of the top of my head, I don't remember a notebook where we show this violin plots. I, I will look into in the in the interval. And, this afternoon, I will pull out. There is something, but I, I don't remember. Thank you. Any other questions? Uh, people online, do you have questions? Um, Thank you very much, Luca. So for the afternoon, what do we need to prepare? Um, so the idea, so I, I will show this, this video that I was not sure I could uh, show, indeed I didn't manage to show uh, in this. Uh, so it's a 15 minutes uh, video that uh, goes through uh, the, um, uh, the specific notebook, um, that is about uh, querying the archive. So essentially, let me share for the last time here. Yes. So, so it will appear in a few seconds, I guess. Yes. So this query the archive here that I didn't talk about uh, in this lecture uh, will be the main focus of the hands-on tutorial because it, it is a notebook. Uh, there is first a video in which Luigi goes through. Uh, so you have to just watch it. Uh, and then you can do something there. The notebook itself, after taking the data from the um, archive, has some first exploratory analysis. So there is some unsupervised learning uh, using clustering and dimension reduction. I'm not 100% sure, but if I, uh, I think there is um, uh, also the method, the, the dimension, uh, the clustering method uh, uh, 
developed by, by Alessandro Laio is in the notebook itself, uh, together with other methods to uh, see uh, what happens. Um, yeah, essentially, so what, what you need to have is, uh, uh, is a connection. <laughs> uh, and, uh, and if you want, you go to this get to work to, to register. Uh, if you can do it uh, in the meanwhile, that would be better. But it's not needed. So in principle, you can run uh, directly uh, without uh, any, not in principle, in practice you can. Uh, it's just that you, if you start doing modifications into your notebook, then you cannot save it online. You have to download it in order to see it again next time. Thank you, Christian. Uh, uh, you say that uh, for hands-on tutorial, we need a Jupyter notebook and for machine. No, no. Oh, okay, yes, sir. Just finish, finish. Oh. Psychic, learn on TensorFlow. Does this uh, li libraries can be translated the same the same tasks? So the the toolkit is is uh, this uh, uh, container. So when you operate on the toolkit, what you uh, are operating on is a container, a Docker container that has already all the libraries installed. So you don't have to do anything you will run it directly inside the Docker container. There is an alternative that you can download the container and uh, there is a very short video of five, six minutes uh, that tells you how to do it. But that is, um, so you, you need to, to download uh, about 15 gigabyte of uh, one, one five of Docker image. If you want to do that, I can point you now at the, at the video. Give me a few seconds because I have it already open here somewhere. Here. Copy link. I put a link in chat. So this is a YouTube video that is part of the video that I will be showing uh, later. But if you go there, you will find the instructions on how to download the local image of, uh, of the toolkit. So you can do exactly the same that I will be showing, but on your laptop. Again, without installing anything else, you just download the Docker image and uh, you have to have the doc Docker installed. Yes. Which university? Who, who is from which university? I have a question here in chat. Yeah. Lucas, which from which university? I am from Humboldt. Humboldt University. Thank you very much. Okay, see you this afternoon, I guess. Yes. I hope. <laughs> see you thank you very much, yeah. So let's thank Luca once again. So we're going to take a break now and then we'll come back in an hour's time um, for the afternoon session. So, thank you.